I couldn't believe it. According to the document I was looking at, John, the boy who would go on to become the Master Chief, died 41 years ago. My protagonist, the greatest hero of our time, was dead at six. It was a major discrepancy, and I needed to find a way to fix it. I'm Benjamin Giroux, and this is Hunt the Truth. If you ever happen to obtain sufficient clearance to call the Office of Naval Intelligence, you'll be on hold for at least an hour. If you ever happen to get a call from them, you will also wait an hour. And in the end, they never unblock the video, so you just end up talking to a really crisp insignia. I am waiting to talk with Michael Sullivan, hoping he can help me with my little records problem. Continue to hold. And it's been 85 minutes. Michael Sullivan, also known as Sully, works for the ONI in public relations. If it seems odd to you that the most secretive agency in our government has a PR department, you're not alone. But that's not something I'd mention to them. Besides, Sully had hooked me up with the assignment in the first place. I was grateful for the opportunity. Office of Naval Intelligence. Public Relations. Ben. Hi, hi, Sully. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks for taking my call. Absolutely. How are the sources? Up until this point, I'd had no problems with the story. All my facts had been lining up nicely, but now I had an obscure document from the far reaches of the galaxy that listed John as deceased. This contradicted everything. I needed Sully to make it make sense, and thankfully, he did just that. <laughs> Welcome to the outer colonies. Nothing makes sense out there. No, I know, I know. It's just, uh, I just want to make sure that I button up all the details. And that's what you're doing. Look, Ben, it's the far reaches of space out there. And the planet you're talking about was glass to hell. You know just as well as anybody that if there are any local records, they're a mess. Okay, so I felt a little stupid. Sully was right. It's a real problem in the outer colonies. Planets destroyed by glassing have bad records. Every researcher knows this, and every researcher knows that questioning that fact is standard fodder for conspiracy theorists. It's a cover-up. That's government secrecy 101. That's a message I received last week from a man named Mishak Maradi. He's one of many truthers out there who've come out of the woodwork since I started doing this story. Apparently, he heard I was investigating the Master Chief. Mishak seems less ridiculous than most of the characters who've been filling up my inbox, but he's definitely been the most persistent. He's left me a message every day for the past two months. I never respond, but I did find the timing of his last message pretty funny. Let me guess. The government is telling you that the records don't make sense because the planet was glassed, right? That's what they tell you. Technically, Mishak was right. That was what the government was telling me. But unfortunately for Mishak's theory, it was true. Glassed planets have bad records. John's childhood friend, Ellie Bloom, has dealt with this reality her whole life. I, have no idea. I recalled what she'd said in her interview. I mean, it can be hard enough out here trying to do business between planets that haven't been glassed. There's so much upheaval. Keeping track of personal records, financial documents, medical records, it's a total crapshoot. In retrospect, I'd probably been asking for this kind of hiccup. Getting cute with the research, opening up a rat's nest of old paper records, and for what? All I dug up from slogging on my own was a few hazy kindergarten stories from Ellie and a nonsensical death record. But things were looking up. Sully had arranged a face-to-face -face interview with ONI Vice Admiral Gabriella Dvorak. That not only got me off-world, but it was on board the newest autumn-class heavy cruiser, the UNSC Under the Breach. Got a private shuttle up, full luxury. They had me riding in style. When I came aboard, Dvorak even greeted me personally. Now, civilians aren't normally allowed on board an active duty ship, let alone given this sort of attention. Uh, I... <laughs> Please, call me Gabriella. Okay. This was not the kind of hospitality I was used to. Um, what, what, uh, what brings you way out here? <laughs> Work. She told me she was on a detachment and in the neighborhood. I guess I lucked out. The white glove treatment continued too. Captain's mess, officer's quarters, the whole thing. By the time we finally got to her office for the interview, Dvorak could have said anything, and I'd have been thrilled. But she's the real deal, and she jumped right into it. It was that finally moment. 
After all the fighting was done, I was helping lead all the prisoners out of the containers. As a lieutenant in the UNSC, Gabriella not only took part in the ground operations that freed John and countless others from the rebel labor camps in Elysium City, but she remembered the 13-year-old as well. She described the liberation. When you saw them, what had been done to them, you realized who you'd been fighting to save. The aftermath of it, uh, it was ugly. Everyone was streaming out into the daylight, squinting, limping, just gray and fragile and sickly. Their backs were hunched, all their eyes just staring at the ground. I mean, they looked, they looked dead. That's when she saw John. He was sticking out like a sore thumb. In the middle of all this just beaten humanity, there's this tall, young kid walking toward me towering over the others, his shoulders back, his eyes forward, and when he passed me, he looked right at me. Looked in my eyes. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't sound like much, but that eye contact coming from someone in that moment who'd been in that circumstance, it was shocking. He looked malnourished and dehydrated like everybody else, but he was so young. And whatever had broken all these people, it hadn't broken him. In the aftermath, Dvorak remained stationed in Elysium City, working in the refugee camps. From the first day, John stepped up to help Gabriella with her duties. She came to know him well over the next several months. There was a point when he told me about his parents, that they'd been abducted along with him. He didn't say much, but um, they didn't make it. Her understanding was that it had gotten ugly in there. They died a couple days apart a few weeks before the liberation, and John was there when it happened. On the rare occasion when John opened up about this, Dvorak says it was memorable. He would get this look on his face when he talked about it. It's hard to describe. I'd see it on him other times, too. He seemed to feel the weight of all that had happened, but still, he was calm. Not angry, not desperate, just... Resolute. He was a remarkable young man. Like so many people at the time in Elysium City and throughout this region of the galaxy, John had lost his home, his family, everything. People packed up whatever they had left, got out of town, and most never looked back. But Dion Govender, John's boxing coach, said many of them found a way to get some measure yeah, of closure. Yeah, definitely. We all got separated and spread out across the planet and uh, the colonies, but some of us were able to cobble together a list of names, I don't know, kind of a memorial that grew longer as we got more information. Yeah, I remember seeing John's parents' names on the list early on, but, but not John. After he missed that last practice, Never saw him again, but I remember thinking, that's okay. You know, as long as I never see his name on this list, that's okay. And I never did. His will to survive left an impression on then-Lieutenant Gabriella Dvorak as well. I think John just didn't want to be a victim anymore. I remember him telling me he was going to enlist. He said he was going to make a difference. I've never been more sure of another person than I was of him when he said that. Out of the chaos of war, from the rubble, a young John was able to forge a purpose for himself, a purpose that would drive him to become the hero the galaxy would one day need him to be. This is the kind of turn in a story that gives me patriotic goosebumps. I was feeling genuinely moved on my trip back home. When I got there, though, Ellie Bloom was going to ruin all that for me. Hey, I just wanted to follow up with you about your story. I'm really confused. Okay, uh, what's... Remember how I said I was going to tell my friend Katrina about it? Katrina was that other girl in John's neighborhood, the third wheel in Ellie's childhood stories of playing with John. Ellie had moved off planet in 2517, but Katrina had stayed. She, she said that John was dead. He died when he was six. Wait, 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 what? What? John was perfectly healthy, but then he just started wasting away. At first they thought maybe it was some autoimmune thing, and then they thought it was something else, and then something else, and then meanwhile he's getting all these tests, but the doctors couldn't figure it out at all, and his parents were panicking. I, it sounded horrible. Then John died. Just like that. I had no idea what to make of this. 
Ellie seemed convinced, though, so I got her to put me in touch with her friend Katrina. Katrina wouldn't let me record the interview, but this woman was adamant. I wanted to discount what she was saying, but she seemed to remember it so vividly, providing extensive detail, I couldn't ignore it. As far as this person was concerned, John was dead. Before I could even begin to wrap my head around that claim, though, here was the kicker from Katrina. John's parents were alive and well in Elysium City all the way up until Katrina left the planet in 2528, four years after their supposed death. She was wrong. She had to be thinking of someone else, or she was lying. Why would she lie, though? I had to admit she seemed pretty convincing, but it didn't make sense otherwise. I still thought I could fix the story, though. Make the pieces fit. Make it make sense. But what I didn't realize was that this crack was only the beginning, and the whole ugly mess was about to split open. Please join me for the next episode of Hunt the Truth. <laughs>